Thank you, Michael. So I wish to introduce our first speaker who has a fascinating talk in store for us, which will focus on the 1766 religious census of Ireland and the digitization of sources and resources for historical research. Dr. Brian Guren is an expert in the history and evolution of census taking in Ireland. He has written on the subject of Irish censuses and on Irish demography, and is especially interested in census sources and pre-census sources for the period before the Irish famine. The religious census of 1766 and the first statutory censuses of 1813 to 1815 are of particular interest to him and his research. In 2022, a volume of Irish demographic statistics from the 1764, 65 and 1766 religious censuses will be published by the Irish Manuscripts Commission and uh, co-authored by Brian himself. So without any further ado, I invite Brian to the le lectern. Thank you. We good? Good. Um, that volume was actually published about uh, three weeks ago. So the 1766 Religious Census volume. Um, okay, has anyone ever heard of the religious census of 1766? Any? No? <laughs> okay, right. Um, let us, let's get going. So Irish public records were held in various buildings and repositories around Dublin and throughout the country before the 1860s. Many of these repositories were unsuitable for storing fragile documents and records were often found to have been damaged by damp, by rodent infestation, and most worrisomely, by fire. The Public Record Office was deemed necessary to ensure the protection, the preservation, and the survival of the records of Ireland. And under the Public Record Office of Ireland Act 1867, one was opened in the northwest corner of the Forecourts complex, with the office handed over to the Deputy Keeper of the Records of Ireland Samuel Ferguson on the 19th of November, 1867. Now there's just a, a, a sample of some of the records that were uh, contained in the Public Record Office. The census returns from the first five statutory censuses were in there from 1813 to 1851. And uh, the censuses from 1861 to 91, the four of those were destroyed uh, by government order state papers were in there, parliamentary records, including the 1766 religious census, county records, um, a, a count, county accounts, administration uh, records and grand jury records, uh, corporation records uh, for towns, um, maps, the down survey maps and so on, uh, wills, parish registers of the established church, the Church of Ireland, uh, came in after in, in the 1870s. Uh, uh, tax records like the poll tax and the hearth tax and so on. So it was a vast collection of records. And as you may or may not know, the building was destroyed on the 30th of June 1922 and almost all the records were lost. Now, the Public Record Office consisted of two separate buildings. So you can see uh, part of the record office here, the building on the left, the squarish looking building, the smaller of the two was called the record house. And that was, that was the building that was accessible to the public. Um, so if you wanted to research the records, you went into the record house in through that front door there on the left. Um, it contained a reading room for researchers, uh, the strong room where records were temporarily retained uh, for researchers, if they were working on them and they were going to return back the next day, they were maintained in the strong room. And some magnificent indexes which facilitated the researchers in identifying the records that they wished to examine. The second building then, the larger of the two, the one on the right, uh, uh, larger, higher, was called the record treasury. And that was so-called because it would contain the treasures of Ireland, magnificent records and collections which documented 800 years of Ireland's history. The treasury was designed with one long aisle running through the middle of the building with 10 letter, lettered bays on both sides of the aisle. So bays were identified by letters 
On the east side, it was letters A to K, and on the left side, letters L to U on the west. Um, just to give you a quick look, that's the record house. So that's where the researchers sat. Um, so you'd go in and you'd sit in the desks there, on the, in the desks at the, at the far end, and then you'd hand up your documents to the clerk, and then they'd go through those double doors on the right-hand side, which would bring them into the record treasury where they'd fetch the records and bring them back into the record, into the record uh, house for you. And then that's a view inside the record treasury. So that's the aisle running down the middle of it. And on the left-hand side, on the right-hand side, you had the bays. There, as I said, there were 10 bays along the, along the east side of the building and 10 bays along the west side. So that's 20 bays per floor. And the building was six stories high, uh, excluding the basement, which had a different arrangement. So the entire treasury then contained 120 individual bays. And an individual bay was identified by a simple number and letter combination representing the floor number and the bay letter. At the end of, is that, is that visible? I'm not quite sure that it is. Uh, at the end of 1894, so that's this, this is showing the organization, this chart is showing the organization of the records. This was in the deputy keeper's report. They published their, an annual report every year, and this is showing the locations of the records uh, in each of the individual bays. So, for example, at that stage, the census records in red there, in the red box, were up on the top floor, on floor six, in bays I and K. Uh, so that's in two bays, uh, holding the census records from 1821 to 1841. And on the other side of the aisle, uh, in bays M and L, there were the, the, remains of the, the remainder of the census records, 1841 and 1851. In the bays, there were numbered shelves, and on the shelves, there were uh, the numbered items, the individual items and the individual record sets. So any single record could be pinpointed by simply providing the bay, the shelf, and the subnumber of the item. For example, collector's accounts were in bay 6E, so you can see there, bay 6E, it's giving collector's accounts. So we might remember that one just now for, the, for the, the, the future. Now over the next number of years, and that's the west side of the, of the bay. So you can see census records on 6L and 6M, as I said, so up there on the top left, there are census records. And I've circled that 50 because that's the parliamentary collection, because that's where the 1766 religious census returns were. Now, over the next number of years, the Public Record Office received into its custody the collections of records which had been lodged in various repositories, such as the Custom House in Dublin, the Record Tower in Dublin Castle, that contained state papers, and the records of the, the defunct Irish Parliament, which included my 1766 religious censuses. The Church of Ireland parish registers after this establishment, because they were declared as public records, wills and testamentary records, taxation records such as the heart tax, and later following a catastrophic fire in the courthouse in Cork City in 1891, when the records of Cork City were, Cork City were destroyed, the records that were stored in county archives and offices around the country were also taken into the record office. And how did they do it? Well, what they did was they went out to the archive that was to be transferred into the record office, and they'd go out and they'd, ex they'd examine the archive and measure up to see uh, how much space the records were going to take. Then they'd come back to, their, back to the record office, and they'd lay out the shelves, organize the shelves as per the arrangement of the records in the archive, and then they'd go out. So each of the bays were differently arranged in terms of the number of shelves and, and so on. And then they'd, they'd, they'd set up the, the, the bay to receive the records and then they'd transfer over the records. So, so basically what they did was they reconstructed the individual archives in the PRO as they moved, as they moved the archives across. Now, the greatest measures were taken to ensure 
uh, the security and preservation of the records. This is all very ironic considering the, the end result in the, of, of the PRO. So they wanted to ensure the safety and preservation of the records in the archive. The record treasury was not accessible to the general public as we know. At the outset, they had used wooden shelves in the initial years, but that was, that was later determined that the wooden shelves were employed in a manner most favorable to, to combustion. So they were gradually replaced by iron shelves to reduce the possibility of damage by fire. And we can follow these improvements to the reports of the deputy keeper published annually from 1869. In, in his 11th report in 1879, the deputy keeper noted that galvanized iron shelving was thereafter to be used. And he also expressed his hope that hereafter from time to time to eliminate the existing wooden shelving from the central and southern sections, as well as the wooden flooring from the galleries of communication so that there shall be nothing inflammable within the building except the records themselves. And these I may observe would be extremely difficult of combustion. So they try to exclude as much wood as possible out of the record treasury to ensure the pre preservation of the, of the records. And by 1892, about 25 years after the archive had opened, no wooden shelving remained and the records were, it was thought, as perfectly preserved from fire as was possible. Furthermore, fire prevention measures had been built into the design of the office at the outset. As we said, the, the building, can, can, the, the, the record office, the public record office consisted of two separate buildings. Uh, and the first deputy keeper's report noted that although externally the record house and treasury appear to constitute one block, so it looks as if it's one building there, one block of buildings of uniform design, but the treasury, which stands considerably higher than the house, is separated from it by an open area 10 feet wide, ac wide, across which is thrown a covered bridge closed by iron doors at each end, forming the principal means of communication between the two edifices. It is heated by warm water pipes from furnaces in the basement of the record house and may be considered effectually isolated as regards any risk of fire from the official part of the building. So that arrow is pointing at the, the fire break between the two buildings. So that there is the 10 feet gap between the treasury and the record house. And that was to ensure that the record house had fires in it for the, to keep the public warm because this is where the public were, were working. So these had fires. So this fire break was to ensure that if a fire happened to break out in the record house, the treasury was going to be, the records in the treasury was going to be were going to be preserved. And all that would be sacrificed was whatever records were in there that people were working on at the time. And ironically enough, in the end, the fire break operated in the opposite direction because this is the building that was destroyed and this building survived. So the fire break operated to preserve the record house from the fire in the record treasury instead of the other way around. There were no open fires in the treasury, so the only threat to the, off to the, to the office was from fire. So the only threat to the office from fire, it was considered involved a fire occurring in the record house and the 10 foot fire wide fire break would preserve the fire from spreading from the house to the treasury. Now there's what you would have filled out if you went into the record office, that's a, an inspection docket. It was filled out on the 26th of February, 1918 and it is for collector's accounts, right? And that's the, the code or the location for the collector's accounts for Londonderry for 1690. It was in Bay 6E uh, on shelf three, and it was item number four on the shelf. So if you went into Bay 6E, you would have seen the shelves on the left-hand side and on the right-hand side. You would have gone down to the third shelf and taken the fourth item off it, and you would have gotten your collector's accounts for Londonderry. And if we just quickly scroll back here, remember our collector's accounts that we said? They're 6E, so that's where, that's where they were. And that document, if you see a signature, can anyone read it? Tennyson Groves, T. Groves. Anybody come across Tennyson Groves? He's a great, great, uh, great hero of mine. 
That's Tennyson Groves. We'll get, to him. we'll get to him coming up shortly. He was a genealogist around working in the record office around the 1900s and 1910s. And uh, because of him, it's because of him that I'm giving this talk, because if it wasn't for Tennyson Groves, there'd be very little of the religious census surviving. Now, as, as we said, the archive contained the complete census returns from Ireland's first five statutory censuses. Uh, the first five statutory censuses that were held in Ireland. They were 1813 to 1815, which was the first Irish statutory census. It didn't successfully enumerate Ireland. So another census was held in 1821, and thereafter censuses were held every 10 years, every decade. 1821 was the first census to be successfully completed. Um, it recorded the names of everybody living in the country. 6.8 million people. That was, they were contained in 480 volumes of census returns that were in the archive. Um, and then 1813, 1841 was the first Irish census to be held on a particular day. That was census day, 6th of June, 1841. Uh, and 1851, which was the first Irish census after the famine. So comparisons between 1841 and 1851 gave an indication of what had happened and the, the demographic catastrophe that the famine was. It is worth noting that the census returns from 1861, 71, 81, and 91 were deliberately destroyed by government instructions, and they were never moved or located in the public record office. The deliberate destruction of censuses is not particularly surprising given the attitudes towards the records at the time. And it's an indication of how research priorities have changed over the past 150 years when we see the first deputy keepers uh, report, that's uh, Samuel Ferguson was the first deputy keeper, appealing that no more census records be sent to the public record office for storage. This is what he said. The population returns are very bulky and with the sequel of the census of 1831 and 1834 and of the several decennial censuses and agricultural returns to 1859 inclusive now occupying more than one half of the entire basement of the record treasury. Altogether they weigh not less than 60 tons and it is difficult to see how provision has been made for the reception of this class of papers in the future as there now remains only a few bays in the basement which can be so allocated, and it would be a misapplication of the costly fittings of the upper treasury to occupy them with such matter, to occupy them with such matter, even if the requirements of legitimate record accommodation should leave any part of these fillings, fittings unoccupied. Now, we said at the start that the census records were held on floor six, but here he's talking about them in the basement. That was because when they came in uh, initially from the custom house and from the record tower in Dublin Castle, they were moved to the basement and they remained in the basement because Samuel Ferguson had such a disparaging attitude towards the census. So they remained in the basement until Ferguson was replaced as deputy keeper. And once he was replaced as deputy keeper, immediately the next de deputy keep keeper, Diggs Latouche, moved him right up to the top floor. But Ferguson had a really disparaging uh, um, um, attitude towards the census, seeing them just as clutter, like he describes in there and that as it would be a misapplication of the costly fittings to occupy them with such matter. So it's quite amazing to see that in the 1860s and in the 1870s, the census records were been looked down upon, and now they're one of the most popular records for, 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 for uh, uh, researchers in, in, the, in the National Archives uh, if they, in, in cases where they survive. Now, so they're the, they're the statutory censuses, and although the first statutory census, as we saw, didn't commence in Ireland until 1813, a remarkable census was held about a half a century previously in 1766. In that year, the House of Lords resolved that the several archbishops and bishops of this kingdom shall be and are hereby desired to direct the parish ministers in their respective dioceses to return a list of the several families in their parishes to this house on the first Monday after the recess, distinguishing which are Protestants and which are Papists, and also a list of the several reputed Popish priests and friars residing in their parishes. So that was a resolution of the House of Lords. 
they were directing the bishops and the archbishops of the Church of Ireland, because that was the established church, that was the official state church, to get their ministers to return lists of names of their parishioners, the people living in their parishes, including Catholics and Protestants, and uh, all, all religions, dissenters as well, to return a list of the several families, so a list of the householders with the religion indicated and the list of priests and friars. And the first Monday after recess was the 5th of May, 1766. Now, this resolution of the Lords was passed on the 5th of March, 1766, so that gave them two months to, pre to prepare their censuses and get them into the House of Lords. And this marked the commencement of the 1766 Religious Census of Ireland on the 5th of March, 1766. Now, those instructions seem, seem clear enough. They were requesting a list of families, that's the names of the householders, with the religion of each, each householder indicated. Now, in 1766, the population of Ireland can't have, been, can't have exceeded 3 million, with probably about 2.75 million people. And given that the mean household size at the time, the size of a household was about five, then if this census was successful, lists of names totaling about 550,000 names should have been received at the House of Lords. So there should have been a, a list coming in from individual parishes and they should have totaled up to well over half a million names. The end result, however, fell well short of that target. Some ministers completely ignored it, ignored the order and made no returns at all. So some parishes just didn't respond. Some ministers did not provide a list of householders' names, but they merely returned the number of Protestant and Catholic families in their, in their in their parishes. So they'd send in a return uh, saying, in my parish there is X number of Protestants, X, Y number of Catholics, and that was it. Some of them even, when they got the order, they flipped it over and wrote it on the back and sent back in the order back with just those, those, those brief notes on it. Some ministers went a little further, returning numbers to town and level, but still failed to return a list of the names. But many ministers, albeit probably a minority, complied, providing a full list of parishioners in their parish, parishes. And some of these lists were, were, were quite extensive, like there'd be a thousand names or, or, or so. One parish that I know of in Waterford returned over 6,000 names. Okay, so even writing a thousand names is going. These were this was a considerable effort that that the the, the uh, a considerable task that the um, that the lords and the, the archbishops and the bishops were putting on their clergymen, which for which they weren't paid. So many some many ministers complied, providing their list of names, and some ministers exceeded the terms of the lords' resolution. In some cases, by quite a considerable degree. Now, I'm going to show you on the next slide, I'm going to show you a map that I'm working on at the moment, but it's only partially complete, but it will give an indication uh, for the northern part of the country of what we have, right? Now, so it's only partially complete, and what it is showing is the dark red color there, okay? So you can see up around Donegal, it's almost all dark red, uh, West Tyrone and uh, East Galway. Um, Leitrim, places like that, down Trumana, and they're all dark red. They're parishes that returned numbers only. So those guys were failing to comply with the resolution of the House of Lords. They were just giving brief uh, 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 numbers. But the green, the dark green, are parishes that returned the list of names. So that was hitting the requirement or exceeding the requirement of, of, of the, the House of Lords. So they were returning lists of names. And you can't really see it on this map, but up around there, up around Armagh and Tyrone, you can see little yellow spots possibly. Uh, you might not, it probably won't be clear to you, but some of those have, have little spots and down around Tipperary here have little black spots uh, as well. They are original returns that survived. The original records from these like, were really, really lucky in that the 1766 census, it's the only part of the entire parliamentary records that were in the public record office that survive. Okay, so we have original returns from these, from a small number of parishes around the country. So this is, this is really exciting for uh, the Beyond 2022 project. So, 
if, the, if everybody had complied, of course, the map should be entirely dark green, but it's not. You can see that there are very large sections uh, of the country which, which fail to return uh, lists of names. Uh, it may appear from this map that the majority of ministers failed to meet the terms of the requirement because there's far more dark red on it than dark green. But by the time I finish it, by the time I get that down and finish off in the southern, southern diocese down around Cork and Ross and Limerick and uh, Cashel and Emily and Ossery uh, and Waterford and Miss Moore, there's plenty of dioceses still to go, there's plenty of work to be done on it. By the time I get it finished, the, the results will be closer, a little bit closer to 50-50. It'll probably still be the case that a majority of ministers didn't return names, but it's going to be a bit closer to 50-50 because the provision of lists of names predominated in the southern diocese. Now, since this census was initiated by Parliament, the returns were stored with the records of the Irish Parliament, and they were transferred to the Public Record Office in the 1870s to be lodged in Bay 5-0. Because many of the returns contained lists of names, along with denominational allegiances, these returns proved particularly appealing to genealogists at the opening of the 20th century. And many of the returns were transcribed either in part or in full uh, at that time. Notable genealogists who extracted information from the 1766 returns were Tennyson Groves. Have you ever heard of him? He's our these are collector's accounts for London Derry. So Tennyson Groves, he was a, an Armagh man, and he focused his attention on the parishes in the, diocese, in, the, in the northern diocese of Armagh, Derry, Dromore, Down and Connor, and Ruffoe. So he extracted uh, surviving information from the 1766 census for, for those northern dioceses. And because of that, we have the, the, the record or the transcriptions of, of those returns, of many of those returns survive. Uh, Bartholomew O'Keefe, a priest uh, from uh, Cloyne, transcribed the complete set of the, the returns for Cloyne Diocese that's down here, which I haven't got to mapping yet. So the entire, even though the originals have been lost, a, a full transcript of Cloyne survives as well. Uh, William Carrigan, uh, another priest, was interested in Ossery. Um, Michael Comerford was interested in Kildare and Lachlan and extracted uh, information from that. And Philip Crossley focused on uh, the, uh, the tomb arch, uh, Archbishop Rick, principally the Diocese of Elphin, Kalala and Connery and Killaloo. In some cases, they transferred the censuses completely and in other cases, they extracted numerical abstra uh, abstracts. And let's just have a look at some of them. This is Tennyson Groves transcribing the returns for Carlingford Parish in 1766. Uh, and he, 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 it's a list of families in the parish of, uh, a list of families in the parish of Carlingford compiled on the 29th of May, 1766 by Paul Twig, vicar of Carlingford. And these are the lists, these are the lists of names, survives completely. It's not the original, it's Tennyson Groves transcript. And we're very lucky to have this. So if you were a genealogist with an interest in Carlingford, this would be a fantastic source for you. This is uh, Bartholomew O'Keefe, who was focused on Cloyne. This is his return for um, uh, Tully Lease Union down in County Cork. In this case, this is the complete return. This is the return that was there. So in this case, there's no list of names. This is just a minister who returned numbers only but again, it survives uh, as, a, as an excellent transcript. And here's a snippet of Philip Crossley's uh, extract for Temple Boy in County Sligo, providing list of names here. So he, this minister provided a list of names, but also giving the number of people in the house. So this was not a requirement of the House of Lords. So this minister went beyond the terms of the, of the Lord's resolution. What's most exciting about the, about the surviving information from the 1766, however, is that 59 original items uh, survived from it, original returns that were received from the ministers. And many of these original survivors are truly magnificent. So here's some of them. This is a wonderful return for Calicial County Tyrone. Again, it didn't return the names. So that's one of my red uh, parishes on the map. It's for Calicial 
and the Diocese of Armagh, a county Tyrone, so he gives the known to be what they really are, the spawn of Scottish Covenanters, avowed enemies to all civil and religious establishment, and the most virulent and ferocious persecutors of the established church during the late tumult in the north of Ireland. Many of these ministers, these, these ministers were living in quite remote areas, many of these, and this is their first ever opportunity that, they were, that they've ever had to communicate with, with officialdom in Dublin, and boy, are they taking advantage of it. So this guy is, he knows that he's never going to get to speak to Dublin again, so he's taking uh, uh, the, the full opportunity that he had. This is a return for count, Loud Parish in County Louth, and this is a fascinating one. I didn't transcribe it, but what, it, what he says, the above list, and again, he only provides numbers. He didn't provide names for, for, for this minister. The above list was made by persons the best qualified to make it, and I do believe it to be done with as much care and exactness as the time would allow. I need not observe this return considered as a ground for computation that there is not a new in the families returned as popish, one single Protestant. So in the Catholic, Catholic families, there's no Protestant at all. Uh, returned as one single Protestant, nor is there one family returned as Protestant. So that's of the 14 Protestant families, no, not even the parish ministers in which there are not papists. It is so general, it is so general a case. I cannot find that there are yeah, so what he's saying is that they're the Protestant, they're the Catholic families, 725 Catholic families, and there's not a single Protestant in them. But in the 14 Protestant families, there are Catholics. They were in there as typically as servants, but sometimes as household members as well. And that was that was quite common. Any of the returns that contain religious breakdowns within families will often show that Protestant families had Catholic members at the time, but Catholic families didn't have Protestant members. Um Here's a magnificent return for Ratbury County Cork, an original return. So this is an original survivor. And in this case, he provides the list of names in this. So that was the terms of the, of the Lord's resolution. But he also gives, this is the, so this is James Mead. And then he's giving the number of Protestants in his house and the number of Catholics in the total. So James Mead would have been recorded as a Protestant householder, but his house had three Protestants and four Catholics. Richard O'Donovan's house had two Protestants and four Catholics as well. So it, that's providing much more information that the, 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 than, than that the House of Lords had asked for. So that's a wonderful return. And you can see water damage on it here as well, which is lovely to see. Great to see something like this surviving. This is a return for Athassel Union in County Tipperary. It's again an original return, providing the list of names and beautiful writing. Uh, and in this case, they're providing religious breakdown by sex. So he's even going further than, than, than the Ratbarry return. So he's giving the number of Protestant males. So Oliver Latham's house had three Protestant males, three Protestant females, four Popish males, and two Popish females. So of the 12 people in Oliver Latham's house, uh, six were Protestant, six were Catholic. So they're giving sex breakdown and religious breakdown. So that's getting, getting even better. And this is the most magnificent surviving return. It's the jewel in the crown of the 1766 returns for a parish called Newcastle in County Tipperary. This must have represented the, the invention of the Excel spreadsheet. List of names, details, the number of children, ma uh, males un above, sons above 14, sons under 14, daughters above 14, daughters under 14, men servants, maid servants, Men relations, friends, or lodgers. Women relations, friends, or lodgers. Number of Protestants, number of papists, total number of souls, and the number of the house. So 14 different columns. So to get that information, he was only asked to provide a list of names, and he went out and he he went out around from house to house to get this information. And he does say at the end, I didn't put it in there. He does put in a little note saying. I found it really difficult to get the information from Catholic houses because there was a rumor around that our children were going to be taken off us. So they, they didn't know what the, what the survey was about. So this rumor got around and people were, were denying, the, denying the information. Now, so that's, the, that's New Castle County Tipperary. It's the most beautiful of the, of the, and the most informative of the uh, uh, surviving 
uh, originals. In some cases, we have original seals like this. So this is the postal stamp, and that's the seal of the minister who sent it in. It's from Calicial County, Tyrone, which we saw earlier. Stamped, postal stamp, 2nd of April, uh, 1766, when it was posted from Armagh, and that's the, the minister's seal. So it's really lovely to see something like that when you have the seal still present or the postal date. And just to conclude now, because I've gone a little bit over time, with two interesting stories. Um, that's the 1766 envelope for the, that contained the return for Loch Gaul County Armagh. You can see there, the census return was addressed to Henry Baker Stern on the 28th of April, 1766. That's this, 28th April. And it's posted from that top one up there, that top writing up there says Armagh. It's posted from Armagh. And that's the name, Henry Baker Stern, Esquire, Clerk of the House, Clerk of the Right Honourable House of Lords. So that was uh, Dublin. That was all the address was, okay? Addressed to Henry Baker Stern on the 28th of April. There's the Dublin Courier of the 25th of April, 1766, three days before the letter was posted, died a few days ago on his way to Bath, Henry Baker Stern, Clerk of the House of Lords. So by the time the Loch Gall census was posted Henry Baker to Henry Baker Stern, he was dead about a week at that stage. So the, Baker Stern, just by pure coincidence, died in the middle of the census. So all these census returns were pouring into the House of Lords when the clerk was dead. So they were being addressed to a dead person. And this is, this is uh, the most tragic thing of all, uh, is that the PRO, as we know, was destroyed on the 30th of June, 1922. So this is the record treasury. It's absolutely wrecked. It was built with such, uh, with su such enthusiasm, with such, with, with, with such determination that the records would be preserved. And the, the record office was so thorough in, in how they went about their job. If we look at the census again, if we look at the 1821 census, they didn't just take in the 1821 census into the record office. The act that specified that the 1821 census be taken also said that the individual counties were to make copies of the census, right? So they were to have their own copy in local custody. And after the burning of the court courthouse in 1891, the county records had to come in. So all those copies of the 1821 census came in as well. So it wasn't just that the 1821 census was destroyed, by pure fluke, the copies of the 1821 census were destroyed as well. So it's a really real, real tragedy. And what we are trying to do, as you know, with the Beyond 2020-22 uh, project is just to recover some bits of that, that archive for future generations. So thank you for your, your interest. And, uh, This is the Irish House of Lords. Ireland had its own parliament from the, ooh, the 12th century up until um, 1800. It closed in 1800. And Ireland became part of the United Kingdom on the 1st of January, 1801. So there was a parliament. If you uh, are in Dublin, and if you walk down this direction here, if you come out, you turn right, go down to Grafton Street and turn right and just go right down to Grafton Street. You'll hit Trinity College. You'll find Trinity College on your left hand, on your right hand side. And the building opposite, a magnificent rounded uh, building is, the, is the, uh, the old Irish House of Parliament. It's now the Bank of Ireland. Uh, but that is where the Irish Parliament sat up until, uh, up until it closed its doors. And I think it was August uh, uh, 1800 uh, and then Ireland. Uh, Ireland became part of the, the United Kingdom on the 1st of January 1801. So it was the, the Irish Parliament, all right, uh, not the, and the Irish House of Lords that instructed that the 1766 census be taken. Yeah, good. Brian, thank you very much for that. Really insightful and certainly detailed. And I think I share everyone else's thoughts here. Such a lamentable situation that many of the records, of course, were destroyed in 1922, as you outlined. 
But also, it's heartening to know that um, some of these are being reconstructed through the Beyond 22 project. So um, just to flag that for people to, um, to look out for that project, which will be going online from mid, mid this year, as I understand it. So I think um, maybe at this juncture, it's worthwhile perhaps drilling down on some of the um, issues which you, which you have raised. I suppose that the first thing which comes to mind is what does the 1766 religious census tell us fundamentally about Ireland in the mid 18th century? That's a, that's a good question. It, it tells us so much. It gives us a, an indication of uh, Irish population levels uh, at, at a local level um, well before, 55 years before the first census was conducted and uh, almost 60 years before the first su successful census was conducted. Um, it gives us, it gives, depending on what survives, it can give us indications of um, uh, interdenominational relations. You can get, come across comments like uh, the Calicial comment there about the, the Spanish Scottish Covenanters. There are very many comments like that coming through about uh, about usually dis it, it's typically quite disparaging comments on uh, Protestant dissenters or Catholics. Um, but there's the vast amount of information that that's available in there. And then in terms of genealogy, if if you are a genealogist and uh, a 1766 return survives for your parish, you're you're in a really really great place because th these are fantastic. If they're well conducted, uh, these are very very useful uh, genealogical resources, and that is why so much survives from it because it proved so interesting and so useful to to, to genealogists that that's that's why the genealogists like groves like crossley like bartholomew o'keefe went out and transcribed so much information from it because the, these as records these these are unparalleled records and this was really a a, a fantastic and a wonderful census survey uh, to, to have and it, it it's a tragedy that so much of it was lost because quite because that map that I was showing was showing the coverage from it, not the survival rate from it. So that is important to note that just because you see a parish indicated there in red or green, it doesn't mean that the returns survive for it. There's an awful lot of was lost from it. But the really important thing is that an awful lot survives from it too. And what we do hope to do with Beyond 2022 is to make as much of that available to researchers as possible. Great, indeed. Thank you for that. And that, actually, that segues nicely into the next question, which is how much can we realistically expect to recover from the 1766 census? And how much of that will be useful from a genealogical point of view? And how much will be useful from a more macro demographic perspective of the country? Yes, indeed. Um, we have a, a, a kind of a, a ballpark target with Beyond 2022. What we're trying to do is we're trying to re we're, we're trying to target about a thirty percent recovery of the records within the public record office. Now it's not that's not thirty percent of the entire records. It's thirty percent of the the key records like like uh, um, taxation returns and fiat, fiats and and uh, um, uh, patent rolls and so on. So that's the 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 kind of ballpark target that we're we're, we're talking about. But with the seventeen sixty six census. It's it's somewhat unique in 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 in, in this uh, in this uh, project because firstly we have the original returns, fifty nine original items surviving from it, which is really really good, and you've seen some of those there now. But also uh, because of the the transcription, the interest that 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 genealogists had in it, we and and the fact that so much of the map appears in red that initially when we started out we thought that well if we only have numbers. Well, then that means that that's just an abstract of the original return, that the, the list of names was lost. But it was only afterwards that we realized that actually many of the parishes only return numbers anyway. So the numbers that survive represent the complete survival of a parish rather than just an abstract of the parish. So we're now working on the assumption, and I think fairly solid assumption, that we're going to be able to recover about 50% of the 1766 religious census in terms of what it was at the time in, in, on, on the 30th of June uh, 1922. So this is way beyond our, our wildest expectations. And how this came about, I'll tell you an inter if I have the time, if I have the time. How this came about was really interesting. 
Um, like I've been working on, on with 1766 and on 1766 researching for many years. And it was quite frustrating in that, you know, we had good returns and we knew about the survival rate from, from some areas, but we never had the, the full picture of how many ministers responded. And when I started working on, so if I was to produce that map that I showed you there about two years ago, most of the west of Ireland would have been blank because we really didn't have much information on the west of Ireland at all. And when I started working on Beyond 2022, I came across a reference that uh, Philip Crossley had made, one of the genealogists that I mentioned earlier, uh, he made to uh, a parliamentary returns index. And he gave a page number in it. And I'd never come across this before. I didn't know what this parliamentary returns index was. I'd never heard of it. And over time, I came across three or four more references to this parliamentary returns index. And they were all uh, pointing, saying that the 1766 return for this parish only returned numbers. And I got this information from the parliamentary returns index. And I kept communicating with, with two guys on the project, um, Peter and Kieran. Uh, colleagues of mine in the project about this parliamentary returns index and we couldn't figure out where it was but but because the indexes were produced for the general public they would have had to be in the record house not in the record treasury because the, the idea was that you look up the index and you get the re you get the, the reference and then the records are brought from the treasury into it so they had to be in the record house now if they were in the record house well the record house survived so they should really survive and uh, we we're queried the National Archives and they couldn't come up with it. But eventually, just a couple of weeks ago, about maybe six to eight weeks ago, we got a, a lead uh, on this uh, parliamentary returns index. And uh, I got a reference to it in the National Archives. I went in on the day I had arranged and I said, look, this is what I want to review. They didn't, they, they weren't quite sure what, they, they, they weren't aware that it existed. I went in and it gave the complete listing of the 1766 return, indicating what parishes return names and what parishes return numbers. And that means that I can now complete this map uh, in total. So it was a really, really great breakthrough. Um, <laughs> so we were, we were absolutely amazed that this had survived. <laughs> and it just changed the whole complexion of the project. And if we had found it about 18 months ago, it would have made the, the project a, a, lot more, a, a lot easier to manage because now I'm frantically working in the run up to the 30th of June to try to get the map completed and try to get a lot more documented on 1766 than, than we were able to do. But it has given us the ability to, to firm up on what parishes return names, what parishes return numbers, and uh, be able to come up with a, uh, with a, a valid percentage figure, which is above 50% for, for the survival of returns, which is we're very pleased with. Great. <laughs> Look, this, this was... Uh, yeah, this was something that, that I had... Uh, I had been hoping to do and had been despairing that I wouldn't have been able to do for 15 years and it was just that it was uh, it was just something that just just worked out in the end and it's, it's changed the whole complexion of our approach to the 1766 religious census and and given us this it's clarified in our mind that we're going to restore Re restore and recover over 50 percent of, of 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 this magnificent uh, uh, census which is Thank, thanks brian i think just moving on to our um swiftly to our last question um the fact that many of the ministers essentially failed to obey the resolution of the house of lords would does that indicate a lack of interest uh, about the census on behalf of some of the clergy or what perhaps were some of the motivations for clergy ignoring the dictat from the House of Lords. Yeah, right. To get an understanding of this, like, all, as I said, all that map that I showed, it should have been all in dark green because all ministers were meant to return a list of names. But you saw that the vast majority of the part of the, the area that I showed was red. So they were only returning just bare numbers, just like we saw for Kalishal, something like that, which was, it didn't take long to produce something, uh, 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 write down two numbers and return that to the House of Lords. So it was only a, a very quick job compared to writing out hundreds or maybe even thousands of names. So it might at first appear that 
ministers weren't interested in the task. But I don't think we can actually take it as that. I don't think we, 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 because we have to understand how life was and how society worked in the 18th century. The ministers, even though the resolution said return a list of names, the ministers didn't know that. This wasn't reported in the newspapers. Newspapers didn't report on parliamentary dealings in any way. So the first that they would have known that, there was a, that they had to conduct a census was when they received a letter from the local diocese, from their, from their diocese saying, do this. So the, the, the issue of what the Lords asked for in the resolution is a completely moot point, right? The ministers knew nothing about that. All they received was the diocesan instruction. And it does seem then that, so the key point is what the diocese asked them to do, whether the diocese said return a list of names or whether the diocese said just send back a list of numbers and just get rid of it. So it's the, so many of the dioceses, Clogher in particular, for instance, almost all parishes just return numbers. And we can't, I think the key thing there is what the, the what the, were the ministers being told to sell or to send back to the House of Lords rather than what the, the Lords asked for, because that was something that they didn't know anything about. So that's the key thing. And the fact that that uh, so many areas, like there are clusters, clusters return names and other clusters re return numbers. It seems as if different instructions were being sent to various ministers, uh, possibly based on local deaneries or local breakdowns, even within the diocesan office. Uh, there might have been three or four people responsible for sending out the letters and compiling the letters. So one minister, one per clerk might have got one particular area and he might have provided completely different instructions. So it's it's still a, a question that's quite open to us. So, yeah, it's, it's very interesting. But I don't think we can say uh, for definite that if a minister just didn't return the list of names as the Lord's asked that that indicates a lack of interest because he might not have even known in any in any case. And there is one interesting response from uh, a, a, a minister in Rafo Diocese, in uh, Letamachalwarge, in Rafo Diocese on the west coast of Donegal, where he writes back, and he provided just the numbers only, but he did say uh, in it, he said, oh, well, he, I'm paraphrasing, he received the, the instruction and all of us, uh, and immediately, the Protestant parishioners got together to start wondering what was all this about. And the, their expectation was that it was something to do with introducing more penal legislation. But it did qu quite, cause quite a stir up in the parish, wondering what was all, all this about. So they just received an instruction and didn't have any, had the slightest clue what it was about and were only speculating on it. So interesting Great. indeed. Great. Thank you. I think we might leave on that note. But thank you very much. And please join with me to thank. <laughs>